Hey everybody, today we're going to talk about sampling distributions and their relationship to the standard error of the mean. Stay tuned. If you've watched some of my previous videos on statistics, you might have heard me say something about why we need to estimate the amount of error in our measurements. And this is exactly what the sampling distribution is designed to do. To understand sampling distribution, it may be first useful to understand what a standard deviation is, what error is, why we test the null hypothesis, normal distributions, signal to noise ratios, and some of these other things, all of which I have videos on the channel. So if you want to go back and brush up on those things, uh, please feel free to do that. Get a quick refresher, might be a good idea. Now, I have a friend who likes to breed beta fish. And those are the ones with the big fancy tails and fins. And she has a whole room in her house devoted to keeping and breeding fish. It's full of fish tanks, it's amazing to see. Now, her goal is to breed fish with exceptionally long fins. And so she's been doing this for a couple of years now. And she is convinced that she is doing really well and her fins are longer than the average beta. If she wants to turn this into a business and start selling betas, by marketing herself as a breeder of long-finned betas, then it might be useful for her to demonstrate that she's actually producing betas with longer fins. Now we have data from the average beta, and we know what the average fin length is. And the average fin length for betas tends to be about 12 millimeters. We also know though that betas vary and that some have much longer fins than others. The question is whether or not she has been successful at growing longer tails. If she has, then you would expect her average tail length to be longer than the population average tail length. However, we know that just by chance, there might be small differences between samples you pulled from the population. So the question becomes, how likely is it that through randomly selecting betas from the wild that we would get a sample of beta fins that looked like her group of betas? Remember, we know that there is error in our measurement. Our measurement is not gonna be exact because we're sampling. Mostly, this is coming from the fact that there are individual differences between betas and there are different fish in our sample. So if we look at her fish compared to the average of 12 millimeters, her sample of fish has 15 millimeter tails. So that's a little bit bigger, but should we be convinced by this? Maybe it's important to know how much variability there are in wild fish so, because it's possible that she just happened to get a bunch of big tailed betas just by chance. So what we need to know is what is the probability you would draw a sample of betas with an average of 15 millimeter tail length just due to random chance. So this is what the sampling distribution helps us do. To understand the idea of a sampling distribution, imagine what it would look like if you took many, many, many samples and calculated the means of each of those samples you'd get a lot of different results. Sometimes by chance you would get really high values. Sometimes by chance you would get really low values or really a group of really short finned betas. But most of the time you would get sample averages that are close to the population average. This is because the random pattern conforms to the law of errors. And if you're not familiar with the law of errors, check out my video right here on this channel. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take those sample averages that we got from all those different samples we took and we're gonna plot them on a new graph, a meta graph, if you will. And this is going to show you the distribution of sample averages, or we call it a sampling distribution. Now I like to think about this as though it's like the Olympics, but it's the average Olympics. In the Olympics, each country has a competition and they take the individuals, the sample 
from that country, and they pick the best one to represent them in a meta competition, which is all the countries of the world together. But picking the best athlete doesn't necessarily accurately represent our country, does it? So wouldn't it be more fun if they picked the most average athlete out of the bunch and sent them to the Olympics? Then we could really see which countries are the best. That's sort of like what's going on here. Imagine that we took a sample from a population and we calculated the average and then we plotted that on a new distribution. So let's do that. Let's imagine that we had a population of wild betas to draw from. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a random sample of betas from that population. We're going to plot the average of that sample below. So I'm going to pull out five betas. And boop, 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 there's five betas. And it looks like the average of those five betas is about 10. And so I'm going to drop that uh, a little box down here to represent that sample average. Now I'm going to do that again, right? A new sample of five betas, five different betas from the population. And boop, 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 uh, there they all are. And now I'm going to drop those down. Their average was uh, 13, right? And so I'm going to keep doing that. And as I do that, I'm going to keep stacking these boxes on top of each other. And eventually, I'm going to get a whole bunch of samples. I'm going to do this many more times. And what starts to emerge is a distribution, not of individual samples, but of the sample mean. OK, and so I'm going to just turn this into a line. right? And this sampling distribution represents the amount of error in our samples. Think about it. This represents how far away these samples are from the true population mean. That we know the true population mean is 12. And every time we took a sample, we got some value that was close to 12. Sometimes we got things that were high. Sometimes we got things that were low. But for the most part, they were clustered around 12. But we can ask the question, for any one of those samples, how much error was there in the measurement? Well, the first measurement, when we got 10, there it was off by 2. The second time, it was 13, it was only off by 1. We could look at this distribution and we could say, well, how far off were they on average? What's the average amount of error in each sample? And in order to figure that out, we take a measurement that reflects the spread of this distribution. And that measurement is the standard deviation. The standard deviation tells you the average distance of each data point from the mean. Well, if we take the standard deviation of this sampling distribution, that's going to tell us, on average, how far off were each of our measurements. So in other words, how far away are our samples from the true population mean. Now we can give the standard deviation of the sampling distribution a special name. We can call it the standard error of the mean, or I'm just going to say standard error. Hey, I'm just jumping in here during the editing process to mention if you wanted to simulate this on your own, there's a couple of easy ways to do it. First, Dice are cheap. You can buy a big stack of them, and you can roll various numbers to sim simulate different sample sizes. So if you roll three dice, say 20 times each, and every time you calculate the mean that you get on the face of the three dice, and then roll uh, eight dice uh, 20 times and calculate the mean, and see what the distribution of means in each looks like. What you'll get is when you roll eight dice, you're going to get a much narrower sampling distribution that's much more closely aligned with the mean. The second way is that there is a web applet designed exactly for this purpose, and I'll put a link in the video description to that web applet, but basically it allows you to draw a sample from a population uh, and plot it on a, um, on a graph below. And you can do two of these at the same time, and it's kind of cool to play around with. And you can see what kinds of things happen if you have start with a normal distribution or maybe uh, start with a distribution that isn't normal and that kind of thing. And you can simulate 
thousands and thousands and thousands of data points uh, in the click of a button. So just thought I'd share. Back to the video. Because the sampling distribution is normally distributed, we can use the properties of the normal distribution to estimate the probability of observing any specific outcome by random chance. Now, I need good evidence in order to be convinced. And like most scientists, I like to be right most of the time. For me, most of the time means 95% of the time. If I'm wrong one out of every 20 times, I'm not too worried about that. So I'm gonna say that I need a criterion that if I'm gonna find something to be unusual or remarkable or significant, it needs to happen by chance less than 5% of the time. Then I can be sure with 95% confidence that when I say something is true, it's true 95% of the time. In other words, I'll only be convinced if my friend's fish are unusual, such that a similar sample would be rarely drawn from the population by chance, less than 5% of the time. So how do my friend's betas compare to the sampling distribution? Well, I have the sampling distribution depicted here, and the average, as we know, is 12. And I put a line at the area where only there's only a 5% chance of getting a sample above that line. If you look at the average length of my friend's fish's fins, then you see the length is 15 millimeters on average. Now, that's arguably better than the population average. However, it doesn't cross that line that I said was important for me to be able to accept that this is not simply due to random chance. So while her fish are impressive, I'm not convinced. Now, there's one more thing to consider here, and that is the sample size. In my video on signal-to-noise ratios, I mentioned that collecting more data can help you boost the signal relative to the noise. You can either boost the signal or reduce the noise. Now, it turns out that the data we collected here uh, what happened about five years ago, and that's when we first started collecting data on her fish. Since then, she has expanded her collection, and she went from the few fish she was originally keeping to now she's got over 100 fish. She's, this is basically a, a full-time job for her now. She's just constantly trying to keep up with these fish. Now, since her sample is larger, that means it's more representative of the population that it represents. Now, because of this, the averages for larger samples tend to be more true to the population than with smaller sample sizes. As sampling size goes up, the sampling distribution gets taller and narrower. There's less spread because there's less error in the measurement. So what would happen if we increased our sample size from five to 10? Well, it, you can see the sampling distribution for a sample size of five, and that's the same one we were looking at before. Now, if we increase the sample size to 10, notice that it gets narrower and more concentrated around the population mean. In other words, as sample size increased, error went down. I should note, however, that the benefit of adding participants goes down as the sample size gets larger and larger, such that by increasing sample size from 10 to 11, in other words, by one, we get a substantial benefit. However, if we increase from 100 to 101, even though it's still the same amount of participants added, we get less benefit from each one. This is similar to diminishing returns in economics. So now, let's compare her sample mean to the sampling distribution. We have enough data to be convinced that her tails are in fact longer, and it probably isn't due to chance, even though her tail length didn't change. We reduced the error, we reduced the noise, and now we have enough evidence to say that her tail sizes are larger than the average.
Okay, and that's the sampling distribution. It's simple, right? Oh, but wait, you say. I don't want to collect a bajillion samples in order to get a sampling distribution so that I can calculate a standard error. I don't have that kind of time. Well, do I have good news for you? All that error between the samples comes from individual differences in the population, right? Because every participant is a beautiful snowflake, a unique individual. Well, what about the spread of the data within our one sample that we took? Why is it spread out at all? Why are the participants in there different? Well, it's because of the same reason. They have individual differences, and they bring those into the experiment. Now, this is key. Because the error between our sample and the spread of data within our sample comes from the same place, individual differences, we can use our sample standard deviation to estimate the sampling distribution's standard error. We just have to tweak it in two ways. First, we need to account for the sample size. We need to make sure as sample size increases, we get a smaller standard error. So if we were to make a formula, you would expect to find the standard deviation and then divided by the sample size would give you, as sample size gets larger, the standard error gets smaller. But the second adjustment that we need to make is to be sure that we account for getting smaller returns as we add more and more participants. So in order to do that, what we do is we take the square root of the sample size instead of the sample size straight out. That way, with each individual added, we get slightly less and less and less change in error. So that leaves us with the following formula for the standard error. We have the standard deviation from our sample divided by the square root of the sample size. This formula allows us to estimate from our single sample average, the average amount of error across all possible samples. How cool is that? So to sum up, the sampling distribution is the distribution of all possible sample means which could be drawn from the population. Assuming that the data are normally distributed, it will be a normal distribution. So we can use those properties to start estimating probability. The standard deviation of the sampling distribution is what we call the standard error, which describes the amount of error in the average sample. As the sample size increases, the standard error starts going down. Increasing the sample size makes the sample more representative of the population and drives down the error. We can use this information to estimate the standard error of the mean from our sample, which makes us really drunk on power, because this is the key piece of information we need to be able to determine the probabilities of observing our sample due to chance. And this is key to how a t-test works. I've got more videos coming on this topic pronto, so I think we're about ready to start doing some statistical tests. So subscribe to make sure you're here for that. And until next time, keep thinking. Hey, you know what's fun? pushing buttons. So why don't you push the like button, subscribe, leave a comment, help us grow our channel so we can get the word out and help as many people as possible. Thanks.